neutral energy. Um, and that is, I mean, that it has a history of at least 30 or 40 years back that uh, environmental action groups were very much against it and uh, not in my backyard activists. And so this legacy is still there and it's very unpopular. Uh, I, before I will make my case that we need nuclear energy, I will take a look at a few classic objections to nuclear energy. This is really the, the favorite of all anti-nuclear activists. There is no solution for nuclear waste, um, especially the high level nuclear waste, the most radioactive stuff. So uh, used uh, fuel rods, etc. So uh, every now and then Greenpeace climbs some chimneys or whatever, and then they put up this banner that nuclear waste will be toxic for 240,000 years. Here we see some activists, they say, don't nuke the climate. Uh, I don't know, it's interesting poetry, but what does it even mean, nuking the climate? This man here has chained himself to a, to a railroad uh, because he wants to prevent a train with nuclear uh, waste traveling to a reprocessing plant, which is interesting because actually he tries to prevent the reduction of nuclear waste because reprocessing reduces nuclear waste with about well maybe half or three quarters i'm not sure but anyway it's it makes sure that there is less nuclear waste than without reprocessing and greenpeace and other clubs try to prevent that makes no sense in, in my view okay there is no solution for nuclear waste how is that um this this one thing that it stays toxic for so long, for 240,000 years, is true. I mean, you could even say it stays toxic for a million years or even longer. But the funny thing is we never hear this argument for stuff like lead or mercury or cadmium, which stays toxic forever. It doesn't have a half-life, it stays toxic forever. And still we are dealing with lead and mer mercury. So uh that in itself is no argument that we cannot deal with nuclear waste so uh to cut a long story short it is my position that the nuclear waste problem is solved and i want to show you uh, why so this is a picture of uh, onkalo uh, in finland which is a, a repository for nuclear waste a repository is is a uh, by definition uh, a storage, a permanent storage for nuclear waste. Finland is the most advanced in constructing such a repository. Um, it's partly finished now and they will start burying nuclear waste there in 2025, maybe two or three years later. Um, oh, sorry, I have to go back. Yeah, uh, it's interesting that there is not really public opposition to building this repository and uh, the Green Party in, uh, in Finland, which is part of the uh, government coalition, is in favor of nuclear energy, which is quite a big part of, uh, of electricity uh, in Finland. Finland is by no means unique. Uh, Sweden has a repository under construction, which will be finished pretty soon. France also, and Belgium has built a, a prototype repository, but they are not allowed to, to proceed with actually building it because the, the politicians won't allow that. So here we are again, this is a diagram of Onkalo, the Finnish repository. Um, so it's near the coast of the Baltic Sea. You see vertical shafts going down 450 meters deep. And then there's this access road where you can actually just drive a car down. And then you get here too. Um, this repository is built in a, in a solid block of granite and from geological research we know that this block of granite has been essentially unchanged in the last 1.9 billion years, not million, billion years. Um, which shows that um, geological uh, repositories, they are uh, that we can predict their behavior at a time scale which is much larger than the time scale for let's say human civilization or climate change or things like that where the time scale is maybe thousands or, or tens of thousands of years 
the geological time scale typically is, is millions or sometimes even billions of years. Okay, um, so this is what how it's this is finished now. And soon it will be extended, this repository with all kinds of galleries where they will actually bury the, the canisters with uh, high level radioactive waste. And the whole principle of the thing is that the, this safety of the, the repository is passive. It means when all the waste has been uh, stored here, you just fill up all the galleries, all the uh, all this stuff, you just fill it up, cover this up and forget about it. You don't need to maintain it. And it would even be better if everybody forgot where it is. So you, you, can't, you can never dig it up again. That's the principle of uh, passive safety. Meanwhile, wh what is happening in the Netherlands for dealing with uh, the high level nuclear waste? Well, all practical research for building a repository has been banned. The, politi the, yeah, the politics won't allow it. Uh, it's now uh, presently stored uh, above ground at the Covra. And the high level waste is stored in a special special building, the Haboch. This is this building. Um, uh, the, an interesting detail is that the color of the building changes every five or ten years or so they, they do a paint job on it and at first the color was bright red and now it's orange because the, the radioactive uh, waste inside is cooling off it's it's degrading it has a, a half-life and so <laughs> they will the building will have a less uh, bright color as, as time goes on what you see here is the, the mock-up, the, the maquette of the, the scale model of this Haboch. And uh, an extension is uh, planned, will be built next to it. And uh, you see the, the model of that here. Um, so actual research for a site is banned in the Netherlands, but there is a theoretical study, the Opera Safety Case, to find a site, a suitable site in uh, in the Netherlands, in the so-called Boomse Clay, which is a large underground uh, clay deposit, um, which has suitable uh, places for building a repository. Although to find an actual site, actual a new additional drilling should be done to to make sure you're, there are no uh, fault lines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But on the other hand, um, the Netherlands is ambiguous about this. You know, on, the one, on the one hand, they say, yeah, we will build a repository in Holland uh, around the year 2100. On the other hand, they say they have a dual track policy, which means, uh, in my words, the national, not in my backyard policy. Because although there is a European law that every country will store its own nuclear waste, uh, the Dutch are still lobbying for a European high level waste repository, so they don't have to find a site in the Netherlands itself. I mean, there are, there are scale advantages. I mean, it would be cheaper to have a, a common repository in Europe, but the main motivation seems to be uh, that it is not in my backyard. Okay. Um, what I say here will make a lot of people quite angry. I say the science is settled when it comes to the safety of uh, geological repositories for high level waste. Um, also, it's not so it's not the case that, that you need a very special site. It's not like a, a like a unicorn site in, in the geological underground that you need to find. There are large pieces of the of the deep underground which are suitable for building such a rep repository. There's, there's much more space than we really need. Uh, I talked about, oh, sorry again. I talked about passive safety already. To me, that should be the, the principle for a nuclear repository. So when you have, there's talk about transmutation of waste to reduce half-life, half very expensive, uses a lot of energy. And for some waste, it is not even possible. Then there's talk of repositories. Actually, in in the, in the, in, the, in Holland, it, one of the principles is that the, the waste should stay retrievable even after centuries. You should be able to get it out again, which is, in my opinion, an insane principle. Okay. Well, you can read some other things here that are all solutions in search of a problem, in my view. 
the nuclear energy that we have is already suitable for the energy transition. So finally, the nuclear waste problem in the Netherlands. It is made uh, impossible to solve by green pressure groups who, who make it impossible to select the sites. That's the only reason they can still call it uh, unsolved. And then they can claim that nuclear energy is unacceptable because the nuclear waste problem uh, has not been solved. Okay, on to the next uh, objection. Nuclear energy is too dangerous. We've had two major disasters since the beginning of nuclear energy. Chernobyl in 1986 and Fukushima in 2011. Uh, major disasters, no, no, no question about it. The, the cost was enormous, the damage was enormous. But what was the, uh, the real danger and what, how were people really affected? So, Chernobyl. Direct radiation deaths, a few dozen. Uh, the, the public health effect that was detectable was uh, more thyroid cancer in Ukraine, a couple of thousand cases, although we're not sure if the better detection uh, was, was responsible for part of that increase. But anyway, thousands of extra thyroid cancer cases. Well, uh, it is just dumb luck for the nuclear industry that thyroid cancer is, is very, uh, uh, very well curable. So nobody, almost nobody died from that. Then there is the, the conjectured, conjectured extra cancer death all over Europe because people, uh, because small doses of radiation are supposed to give you a, a somewhat increased cancer, chance of cancer. Estimates are 4,000 to 9,000. All this is just conjecture. It has never been measured. It, it can't be measured in mortality statistics. And there are problems with this LNT, linear non-threshold hypothesis. I will not go into that because I don't have time. But uh, I mean, it's not at all sure that, that, that this diffuse radiation from Chernobyl will actually cause this number of deaths. And if you believe that, then flying in, in airplanes, passenger, <laughs> passenger uh, airplanes, uh, will cause more deaths from radiation than Chernobyl. Fukushima, direct radiation deaths, zero. Nobody died from ra radiation in, uh, in Fukushima. Uh, detectable public health effects, uh, oh, there we go again, sorry. Detectable public health effects, uh, non attributable, non uh, caused by radiation it's itself or the, or the explosion itself. But the evacuation caused lots of, lots of stress and unhappiness and depression and suicide. And uh, so this, the, um, this evacuation was, in hindsight, almost completely unnecessary. and. We should learn from that for if, if a similar disaster if ever happens in Europe again, we should learn from that that we have to be very uh, uh, careful about evacuating large numbers of people. Okay, about safety, again about safety. Uh, we talked about Fukushima in Japan and Chernobyl in Russia. How is the European track record? More than 200 power plants have operated in, uh, in EU countries. They to in total, they have more, uh, 6,500 uh, years of operation. Well, you can see the numbers here. Nobody ever died from a, from a radiation or nuclear accident in the, in the EU. There were no major disasters. There was one rather serious accident, and that was now 70 years ago or 60 years ago. No public health effects have ever been detected from uh, nuclear-related re re radiation in the EU. Could uh, a Chernobyl or Fukushima-like disaster happen in the EU? Not exactly the same. I mean, the risk that a disaster happened in Europe is, is not zero, of course. But could it happen the same way it happened in Chernobyl and Fukushima? No. Chernobyl was a very different kind of reactor, graphite, moder moderated, and the kind of safety procedures they had there in, in, in the Soviet Union then were, yeah, in, incomparable to what we have in the EU now. 
Fukushima was caused by a, a Richter scale nine earthquake and tsunami. In Europe, it cannot happen. There are no that, that kind of fault lines that cause that big air, uh, big an earth, earthquake. Uh, are not there in, in Europe. They cannot happen here. So, I mean, a major disaster could maybe happen, let's say a terrorist attack or a cyber security attack or, uh, or anything else. The risk is not zero, but uh, it's extremely small. The third classic objection to nuclear energy is it's too expensive. Uh, Hinkley Point is a large nuclear reactor in the, under construction in the UK. And that is the darling of all the nuclear activists because every now and then the media report uh, a new delay or a new cost overrun and, and all the anti-nuclear activists, <laughs> they, they are going, yeah, we told you so. I mean, it's, it, no, it's, um, it, it's dead on arrival. New nuclear power plants are, are like, the, like the Titanic. Yeah. And so I, I put some numbers here. It produces when it's finished and operational. It will finish more. Uh, it will produce more than three gigawatts of energy. Cost probably about twenty-five, maybe even thirty billion euros. Building started two thousand eighteen, finished in two thousand twenty-five. And the price of the of the electricity they, they deliver is eleven cents, uh, which is. Um, a lot more than the price they claim to be for uh, wind energy, which might be in the future three to four cents per kilowatt hour. But now the question is, is Hinkley really such a bad deal? If you look at the power it generates and do a real comparison to how much wind power you need to install to get the same amount of electricity over a year, then, and you also take into account that wind power is unpredictable and you need to you lose a lot if you try to store electricity then you could even say that you may, you might have to install 10 to 12 gigawatts of wind power peak peak uh, peak power to replace or to to have the equivalent of of the hinkley point uh, reactor and so uh, this this price difference is also uh, kind of um, misleading because the, the fact that you have predictable and stable production of electricity has a value of its own which does not is not expressed in the, the marginal cost per kilowatt hour of, uh, of production and in this very low price for wind energy three to four cents per kilowatt hour is not included all the subsidies and all the costs for the infrastructure that is being uh, just yeah just paid for by the government it's not in accounted for in this low price so i would the, the bottom line is it makes no sense to calculate a marginal cost per kilowatt hour per energy source you have to calculate the cost per kilowatt hour of the entire energy mix plus the infrastructure okay uh, even if all these three previous objections were false, you, uh, many people say, stop talking about nuclear energy, we don't need it. Right, don't, we don't need it then? Eh? Okay. Uh, there's this thing uh, uh, about grid stability. You need to produce elect electricity at the same time that the, that the demand is there. We have no electricity storage to speak of. So I made a cartoon here, a cartoon drawing of uh, daily demand. So this is the daily day and night demand of uh, three days. And here's the, uh, yeah, the, the erratic energy production by uh, solar and wind. Just some random uh, curve that I drew with some, a few hours where there's no production at all. No sun, no wind. So if you have 100% wind and solar uh, energy production, nothing else, then this is the deficit that you have to make up for in this, the pink, the pink uh, area. And you have to make up for that with the, with the excess production here. And if you have 100% a, a efficient electricity storage, then these areas need to be the same. The green area needs to be the same as the, as the pink area. Is that, is that realistic? No, it's not, not at all. If you store, electricity 
in a battery, in a lithium ion battery, for one day of electricity production in the Netherlands, you would need a battery that's as big as the Amsterdam Arena, and it would cost about $50 billion, uh, apart from all the infrastructure, but just the, 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 the cost of the battery per kilowatt hour. So other kinds of storage is uh, hydrogen. You, you produce ex uh, excess energy and you use that to make hydrogen. And then when you have a deficit, you use the hydrogen to fire up a, a generator and you get back electricity. But what green enthusiasts almost never tell you is that this cycle, in this cycle, you lose 75% of the electricity. And then if you have, have an energy uh, mix with only 100% wind and solar, <laughs> it comes down to the fact that your excess electricity production needs to be four times as big as the deficit that you want to make up for. So you get this kind of uh, production. And here you see the, the installed capacity. And if I go back two slides to the previous, then you see that there's quite a big difference in the, in the installed capacity that you need. And, and also, of course, then in the price of the electricity that you produce. So, I mean, even w without all the problems of uh, ramping up hydrogen production, the, the fluctuations are enormous, and you have to also the, the the electricity grid has to has to be able to to sustain that. So, what is a more realistic option in my view? That is, that you let nuclear nuclear power plants take care of the base load. The base load is now being taken care of in the Netherlands mainly by coal plants, with, which are the most polluting, and we have to get rid of those. And the plan is to get rid of those before 2030. I would say replace them with nuclear power plants. Then you have the base load covered, then you have again the, this erratic production by sun and wind, but now you only have to make up for this deficit and this deficit with this excess. Um, excess production um, and you can when you don't have 100 percent wind and solar but only let's say 50 percent wind and solar production then you can shift with the uh, with the demand you can do demand uh, delay let's say uh, putting on your laundry machine half a day later when there is solar energy or when there is wind, wind energy you can use the, the batteries of electric cars as, as a buffer to, uh, to store electricity. So then it's manageable. And that, that is why I think we need nuclear energy for the base load. And that would mean building six or seven of these uh, new uh, European uh, uh, power plants. Okay. Um, very quickly, um, not the most important point, but I just want to point out that this is a nuclear energy, a nuclear power plant, the blue box. Then if you want to produce the same amount of electricity with wind turbines, well, here, here we go. I zoom out. Here's the, the blue box again of the nuclear power plant. So here's the nuclear power plant. And this is the, oh no, this is the solar farm that you need to replace this nuclear power plant. And then the green line is the, the wind, turbine, wind turbines. This is a wind farm in the North Sea that you need to replace this um, nuclear power plant. So when you still have space, for, for example, on rooftops for solar panels, that is not a problem. The, the, the density is not a problem. But one, once you run out of free space, so rooftops uh, for solar, uh, space comes at a price, you know, it, 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 you have to pay for uh, for all the, all the room that you take up with, the, with your solar panels and your wind farms. And I, I don't see a, a realistic cost estimate of, of that in, in all these plans for renewable energy many times. Okay, I go on. What would you need to avoid building new nuclear power plants? So, to go for 100% uh, solar and wind and, and a bit of biomass, but that, that's a problem in itself. Okay, what do we need? You would need uh, fast uh, reacting gas powered pl power plants to uh, compensate for the erratic 
production uh, of uh, gas and uh, of solar and um, and wind. So CCS, carbon capture and storage. Well, for one thing, you need to put millions of tons of uh, carbon dioxide in the ground every year to do that. And why would you not instead put a few hundred tons of high level nuclear waste in the ground? I think the alternative is quite good for, uh, for nuclear. Um, a European high voltage grid will even out regional peaks and dips in solar wind. When it's not, uh, when there's no wind here, there will be wind in, in Greece. And when there's no sun here, there will be sun in whatever, in, Czech, in Czechoslovakia, whatever. Sounds nice until you look at the cost of a, a real European high voltage grid. It's estimated at somewhere between 100 and 400 billion euros. And it would take longer than 10 years to build because you have to, I mean, the, the legal complications are, are just terrible, you know, you know, because you have so many countries and, and, uh, and governments to deal with. Uh, what's also being said often is Southern Europe has a lot of sun. We in no Northwest Europe have a lot of wind. So we can just, well, we can help each other. And we store all this electricity uh, in hydrogen and we can pump it up and down Europe from north to south. It's about, it's the same story as for the, the high voltage grid. Um, uh, you, you have to build pipelines from, from, from Holland to Italy and to Greece even. And, uh, I haven't even ever seen a cost estimate for that yet. And also what, what I mentioned already, the electricity, hydrogen electricity cycle is a 75% loss factor. Um, many people who are really enthusiastic about the energy transition, transition and renewable energy, they're also very European minded. They say energy is a, is a European thing. National autonomy is, is old-fashioned we don't need that but if you are if you rely on gas powered uh, gen, uh, power plants to to compensate for the intermittency of solar and uh, and wind we need to get gas from russia from and we have to say thank you to mr putin for that is that what we re really want and even within europe you know we need to uh, if you had this uh, hydrogen pipeline uh, system would we, uh, do we really want to be uh, dependent on, for instance, Italy or Spain or Greece for, for hydrogen gas? I mean, even now with the corona crisis, you see that there's a rift between uh, Italy and the north of, uh, of Europe about compensation, about, uh, about money. Uh, how would that play out if, if we are completely dependent, say, in winter, um, for uh, hydrogen from from a country like in, like like Italy, it, it's pretty naive to think that they that that would not be uh, you no know, used as as leverage to to get other uh, uh, to, to get other favors. Okay, now I've made made all this talk about why nuclear energy is so great. So wh why not go 100% nuclear? Well, first of all, we have already invested in in nuclear in, in wind a lot, so we shouldn't throw that away diversity is important you know you never know maybe there's a massive cyber attack on, on several nuclear uh, nuclear uh, power plants and they all have to take uh, take be taken down for a while okay then we still have uh, other sources uh also if you have your own solar panels it, it empowers consumers um and which is good to get the, to get, to keep the, the big energy companies in check. And also, which is maybe the most important, uh, an optimal, optimal mix of nuclear, wind and solar is probably the cheapest per kilowatt hour. Because indeed, if you don't produce too much wind and too much solar, you can, the, the, the low price per kilowatt hour of wind is actually a, a real price that you can realize. So the mix, of nuclear, wind, and solar is probably cheaper than 100% um, than nuclear or one and sure, surely than 100% wind and solar. A uh, final note on electricity from biomass. Of course, we should only use biomass from true waste streams. We shouldn't be chopping down forests in Canada and shredding them to, to 
to burn them in coal uh, power plants. That, that's, that's nonsense. But through waste streams, and then if you want to do CCS, use that to, to uh, produce negative CO2 emissions. Uh, use the coal from biomass for, uh, for CCS and you get negative CO2 emissions. Uh, to, 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 um, well, to conclude, a short look back on what, everything I, uh, I addressed here. I, there are many things missing from the public debate about the energy transition and also from the climate accord. Um, the problems with grid stability I just ignored or, or, or uh, downplayed. Uh, the cost of infrastructure is downplayed or ignored. Storage, it just, uh, it just assumed that we will have electricity storage in 10 or 20 years. It's just, uh, that's just a fantasy. It could happen, but we're not sure. Uh, efficiency losses um, from large scale implementation of wind and solar, which will make them expensive, more expensive. And then something I never hear people talk about is the value of national autonomy. I was talking about Russia, I was talking about Italy. It, there is a, a great intrinsic value to having some national autonomy and self-reliance in your energy uh, generation. So this is the, yeah, the, the, the core message. The real issue is to get a sustainable energy mix and it should be affordable, stable, resilient and under national control as much as possible. And that is the conclusion of my talk. Thank you very much. So, hey, thanks yeah. Arnaud. Uh, as I just as I just said, uh, well, thanks and a uh, nice presentation. I think it uh, raised some questions. As I just mentioned in the chat to people who would like to ask a question, yeah. Uh, send me a message or raise your hand uh, and then we'll try to give you all your answers that you want from Arnaud. So let's begin with... Uh, Can I see the, the chat messages too? Uh, I'm not sure what it should do yes. on my computer now. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I think I should get out of my presentation. Mm. Or maybe I should stop share maybe screen. People need your presentation for your for the answer they want from you. Sorry, uh, but I'll just unmute the people and then they can ask their questions. Okay. Let's start with floor. Mm. Yeah, but I wonder where I can see the questions, or will I hear them? You will hear them. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Hi. Um. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I yeah. can hear you. Okay. I had a question because recently uh, in an article by the NOS. Uh, there was a research about the costs of nuclear compared to solar and wind, and they said it was equal, but um, it's only equal if nuclear energy gets, uh, um, how do you say that in English? Uh, like, uh, yeah, a uh, voorsprong, a uh, voorrang. Um, okay, so you mean it gets like preference on, on the grid? Yeah, it only works if it gets preference because the price uh, is a lot higher. Uh, yeah okay uh, renewables uh, are zero euros yeah i i can i i understand your question um that is why i was talking about nuclear energy generating the base load so that would enable nuclear energy to uh to, to generate full power almost all the time uh and that is that is why uh that is what nuclear power plants need because the building costs are so high so once the the power plant is operational it needs to uh, uh, operate at full uh, at full capacity most of the time or all of the time to um, well just to earn back your investment so uh, and then I, I'm not sure you I don't agree that you uh, can call that uh, nuclear energy gets preference over wind and, and solar my point is that you need a good mix and then both have a, their own separate roles in the mix. And then, of course, the, these roles will be different for, for nuclear and for wind and solar because they have, of course, different characteristics. So, um, but I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Well, I was just wondering if you found it feasible to change the whole electricity market then. 
Because that is what would actually need to happen. Uh, I don't think, no, but I, I th if you replace coal power, coal fired power plants now by nuclear power plants, then there wouldn't be not much, not much would change because the, the base load would still be uh, generated by, uh, well, in this case, nuclear energy, while it was being generated by coal uh, power plants. So I don't think that's one of the advantages, I think, of, of building nuclear. You can replace coal plants by nuclear plants uh, almost in the same place, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was just wondering about the electricity market because uh, now gas uh, generators have to be turned, have to be ramped up and down because of volatility of renewables, and yes. a nuclear reactor could not do that, I suppose. True, but then we need to find a solution for the for the intermittency of solar and wind, and uh, anyway, whether you use nuclear or not, and. And then uh, that's a story with the with these gas uh, powered plants that uh, you need to need to do carbon capture and storage uh, to um, make sure that these um, these gas powered plants don't emit any uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So uh, that problem is there anyway, whether you use nuclear for for the base load or not. Okay. Okay. Thanks uh, for your answer. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, nice question. And I think um, to just tag on to this question, uh, in the chat you can see the last message from Jos. Uh, where can I see the chat? Uh, let's see. Uh, can you... I want to see... Yeah, I can, I can read the question. Because okay. The remark, because he says building a nuclear plant takes about 15 to 20 years. So mm -hmm. extra plants cannot even be part of the 2030 solution. So yeah, okay. Um, already and beyond. Okay, uh, I, I have two answers to that. One is, uh, I don't agree that it will take 15 to 20 years. I mean, there, there are now, we have some bad examples of uh, power plants taking 50 years to be, 15 years to be built. Uh, so that's Hinkley Point and also the, the new one in Finland. But that, these are new uh, nuclear power plants, and after uh, and they, these are the first new ones to be built in Europe after decades. So you get the, this this like um, uh, you get this new um, technology that you have to implement, and you get and the, the main thing is you get new regu safety regulations, and you get all kinds of procedures which makes building these uh, plants uh, yeah, a very protracted affair, but it will not take as long after that. When, when the, first two, uh, uh, the first ones have been built and are operational, then all the procedures can be streamlined. So I don't agree that, that uh, building a nuclear uh, power plant, even in Europe, will take 15 years. Uh, that's one part of the answer. The other part is this. Even if it would take 15 or 20 years, then that's right, they're not finished in 2030. But even after, after 2030, the energy transition doesn't stop, you know, <laughs> then you have to go even further with uh, emitting less CO2. So then it would be a solution which uh, would uh, start contributing in 2035 or 2040. So even then, in my opinion, it would be worthwhile doing that and starting with that now. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, there are some people also raised hands in the chat, so I'll start on top with uh, Gerard. Okay, are you there? Ah, he asked, how many plants does the Netherlands need? Can we as the Dutch build ourselves? Or do we need a quicker solution? Not really um, sure what you mean. Yeah. Um, now, so Snellick, how many plants do we need? I had, I had that as a question um, in the... Um, in the thing, how many how many plants would we need in the Netherlands, and could we build it ourselves? Yeah. And do we need a Snelle Kweker reactor? I mean, fast breeders. Okay, the fast, fast breeder. Uh, 
Well, like I said first about this fast breeder reactor, like I said about um, the, the, the thorium reactor and the, the pebble bed and the etc. I think I don't think we that is the solution for the, the, the problem we have in 2030. So if we want to work on uh, on a real solution now, we should start with uh, just conventional nuclear power plants that we can start building now. Um, again, we build them ourselves. We in the Netherlands, uh, probably not. No, you would need to um, uh, order them from um, the, the French uh, uh, nuclear company. Uh, I forgot the name, but uh, the French can build uh, nuclear power plants, and the Chinese. Well, I mean, it's maybe doubtful if you want to uh, uh, go into a contract with them. But but for sure, the French could be uh, could build uh, these reactors. And we, like I said in the presentation, for for our base load, we knew we would need about maybe six or seven uh, of these EPRs, the, the new type of European reactor that is now being built in Finland and in the UK. Thank you. All right, then next question from uh, Manas. Uh, yes, hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding uh, the policy. So in the IPCC report, it says that, uh, that we need to double our uh, nuclear capacity to, uh, to meet the climate thing, uh, mm -hmm. climate goals, which we have conveniently ignored. Uh, to convince people at a national level and European level, do we need to repackage nuclear energy in some sort of form, better reactors, the things that UDAFT is busy with? So is there a different view that is required? That's my question. Um, a, a different view? Um, well, I, I think uh, maybe what I <laughs> presented in my talk is a different view uh, already, but uh, I think, but it is hard in the Netherlands. You know, it's very hard to get um, to get support for uh, for for nuclear as, as as a necessary component of the of the energy mix, even at government level and even at the the right wing party, the VVD. They are they're just completely passive about uh, about nuclear energy. So, um, but but I'm not sure if I'm answering your question with this. But but, but my view is that. And we shouldn't change anything about nuclear energy. I mean, the, the, the reactors that are being built now in Europe are would be fine for us. But we, we really need to make people think again about um, about the need for nuclear energy. Right. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to think, think that maybe this repackaging could uh, help the view, not just myth-busting. Uh, I mean, apart from myth-busting uh, the questions. Mm -hmm. That was just a thought. Uh, there's no correct answer for this, but it's just a thought. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks for your question. There is a couple more. I would like to give the word to Sophie right now. Hi, I have a question that's a bit off topic maybe. Um, how mm -hmm. did you get into science journalism? <laughs> uh, I was a physics student, uh, graduated in physics and uh, uh, and how did I get into it? Well. Partly because I didn't want to become a research scientist, um, but and partly because I was interested. Yeah, from from the already. I mean, already when I was in uh, school, I, I wrote for the school newspaper, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> the, so it was. I, I guess it was some somehow in my genes, uh, and it. Uh, but it was ki kind of a ha hazard pro process that uh, it took a long time before I was a full time journalist. Okay, thank you. Nice. Some off-topic things can be really interesting as well. <laughs> um, then let me check through the questions. There was another question from Leon Baas. I would suggest you ask your question. Uh, yeah, um the question I had first was uh, actually kind of the same as the one as four, so I'll ask another one. Um, a nuclear power plant requires a really large investment uh, until it gets up and running and gets, starts to make money. Mm -hmm. A lot of investors really don't want to uh, invest in it because it is quite uncertain when they will get uh, their money because, mm -hmm. as you see in Germany with the Atomausstieg, 
their investments were uh, suddenly shut down. Yeah. So um, it's also a thing what the Vivedesa said, Klaas Dijkhoff said, yeah, uh, you, can, you can ask for a permit, you can start, a, 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 yeah. start building one tomorrow, yeah. but nobody wants. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I was uh, saying about the VVD being completely passive about uh, nuclear energy. It's true that you, it's a massive investment, and um, and and then over the, the the course of maybe forty or fifty years, you you earn that back by producing energy. Um, uh, what I want to say about that is that um, with every delay in building a power plant, the costs rise because you have to pay rent, uh, sorry, you have to pay interest on the, on this all this money that you lend to build the, the power plant. So actually with every delay, the bank makes more money. And the, the, the huge cost of a, of a nuclear power plant, half of it is interest that is paid to banks. And I think that is something that should be addressed. I mean, I think that the government should um, uh, give guarantees and low interest loans or maybe even no interest loans to to build nuclear power plants. I mean, they, they do similar things with uh, for building wind farms. And uh, so and there's, of course, all kinds of uh, subsidy uh, arrangements for for solar as well. They should do the same for uh, for nuclear energy. Thank you for your answer and your presentation. There is a couple questions left. Mm -hmm. um, let me check. That is. Um, the first one was from Alessandro Cava. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I can hear you. Yeah. Hello, thank you for the presentation, very interesting. Uh, I have two questions, actually. The first one is about the fuel cycle, so if you can uh, talk a bit about this uh, this topic and if there, are, there can be any issue associated with it. And then the second one is about nuclear energy for what concerns other uh, form of energy, so not uh, only uh, electricity, but also, for instance, uh, heating. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, the first question, I did not really get it. So, can you repeat the first question, please? Yeah, about the fuel, because we, I mean, we discussed about the waste, but uh, we didn't cover the part of uh, where the fuel comes from. Sorry, where the what comes from? The, the fuel, the fuel, oh, the fuel required where, for where the fuel yeah. comes from. So, so is your question? Uh, what is your question then? The question is uh, if you can uh, spend a few words about this, because we covered a lot of uh, uh, points or let's say uh, criticism that are usually done to nuclear energy, but there was no discussion about the fuel cycle. So where is the fuel coming okay. from? All right. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the things that I hear a lot about is that the, the mining of uranium is, is a dirty business and then uh, you have the reprocessing, which uh, Greenpeace is very much against. And uh, but what I would want to say about that is that um, okay, one relevant point is that the uh, the, the fuel for nuclear uh, power plants is not a big part of the cost. So um, it's not even that important how how expensive the the fuel is and. Um, and uh, so it's really, it's really not all that important to nuclear energy. Uh, uh, if you say that the point that is often being made that mining is so, uranium mining is so bad for the environment, maybe in some countries it's not done in the right way, but it can be done in a way that is not very detrimental to, to the environment, like in, in uh, Canada and Australia. So, um, yeah, I mean, it is a problem in the sense that you have to do it right, but it's not a problem that is that, that cannot be uh, be addressed. So, um, in that I, sense, uh, I, see, I don't see the problem. I, I agree with this, but uh, this is only about the cost uh, in terms of money and maybe also about the environment. But uh, mm -hmm. if if we talk about uh, security and energy being produced in the Netherlands, then I think that uh, also the 
where the fuel is actually coming from should be addressed. And uh, it's actually a very interesting, uh, uh, I think, point to be covered uh, in the presentation. The moment uh, we are trying to debunk uh, the criticism that are usually uh, done mm -hmm. to nuclear yeah. energy. Um, and now I forgot the second question. What was and that? The second question was <laughs> about uh, the, <laughs> it, it's about the role of uh, nuclear energy for other needs. So not only electricity, okay. but uh, also for instance uh, heating. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing is, of course, that uh, nuclear power plants produce a lot of waste heat, like the same as uh, coal, coal power plants. And it's it's a shame that this waste heat is hardly ever used. It's being dumped in the in the sea. So, uh, if we build new nuclear uh, power plants, then f from the start uh, it should be considered if we can use the waste heat for, uh, let's say, for city heating. Uh, and things like that, and uh, for heating the, the the greenhouses in the that we have in the in the Netherlands. Uh, so that's one point. Uh, the other point is that if we have a nuclear capability, then uh, we can also use that to to store energy, to to store electricity if if we need to need to uh, in hydrogen. You know, it's all these arguments about uh, storing hydrogen, uh, storing solar and wind energy in hydrogen. Um, nuclear power plants can do that just as well. So, uh, if you want to go move to a hydrogen energy, which, which I'm skeptical about, but uh, solar and wind have no monopoly on producing hydrogen, green hydrogen for uh, for that. So, nuclear power plants could do that as well. So, that, those are two observations I would make about uh, new nuclear power plants. Thank you very much. All right, uh, then I think we have time for one more question before all students leave. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. The lectures have started 10 minutes ago. Uh -huh. um, and I would say, let's check if she's still here. Um, the question from Jacinta looks interesting for everyone that agrees with your opinion. So let's hear it. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Arnaud, for the presentation. I think you very nicely summarized important things about nuclear energy, and I very much agree on everything that you say. But sometimes, as a student, I feel a bit powerless to get this message across to like the general public and also the policymakers, because as you mentioned, it is not even in the climate agreement. Mm -hmm. So do you have advice for us students on how to get this message across? <laughs> Mm -hmm, okay, uh, it's a difficult question, of course, but my advice would be, be bold, you know, don't mince words. Um, don't be afraid to sometimes uh, stir people up. Uh, and because the, the, the climate in the, the, the political climate in, in the Netherlands has been dominated for, for decades by uh, groups like Greenpeace, and then that, that is uh, with the general public that those opinions are completely mainstream and, and almost accepted as, as uh, unquestionable truth. And then so you have to be bold in contradicting those truths and just saying, well, like I said, uh, there is no uh, nuclear waste problem. It's solved already. And then you will say you'll get reactions from people. Who, what? What are you saying? That's not true. And then you have like a. <laughs> you have like a, a leverage to 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 get into a real conversation with them. So, w what I find um, scientists and and people and, and experts on on nuclear energy, they are they they are very cautious and very polite in in public discussions. And my advice would be, um, be bold and start from there. Mm. Okay, thank you. I think that's interesting. Uh, maybe uh, interesting as well. Try to try to get into the media by writing opinion pieces and or maybe or maybe even becoming a journalist or a part-time journalist. But st start by uh, writing uh, opinion pieces in uh, in newspapers and on websites. Uh, just you can that's that's not too hard to do these days because there are many websites and etc. So um, yeah, you you have to uh, really try to play the media to get your uh, point of view across. Yeah. Hmm. 
Well, you thank you very much. You don't sound convinced. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just that, uh, like a few, I think it was a few weeks ago, uh, an article on uh, on NOS, like the, the national news platform, mm -hmm. where they posted something like nuclear energy is a possibility, but it's still uh, too expensive. It's like it's always um, when something positive is said about it in the media, it is immediately uh, yep. weakened in a way. And yeah. But I think we should just do our best and, and keep trying. And as you say, maybe it's good to make bold statements and work from there. Um, yeah. yeah, because there, there is a, a really uh, biased consensus about uh, nuclear energy in the media. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's not a, I mean, it's not a, what, it's not a conspiracy, but it's like a, a mainstream or uh, generally accepted opinions and, and journalists many journalists just go along with that they never question that anymore mm -hmm. it make them question that again yeah all right then i think it's time for the last question or side note maybe because i received a message uh, almost 40 minutes ago from someone who couldn't ask this herself mm -hmm. She said, when you mentioned the, the nuclear uh, disaster that happened uh, in Fukushima, mm -hmm. the indirect effects such as, such as ocean pollution and destruction of aqua life uh, have not been mentioned by you. She just mentioned saying no people were harmed mm -hmm. yeah. in this situation. And she thinks it's necessary that these details are also coming across um true but they are details <laughs> um and also uh of course i didn't have to go have time to go into all, all aspects of uh, uh i i really doubt if there was a lot of influence on on nature in uh, by the radiation from fukushima uh, of course some some radiation leaked into the the bay there and uh, some uh, let's say I'm just quoting from from the top of my head, but some uh, let's say some uh, seafood got contaminated and unfit for human consumption, which is all fine and well. You have to be careful about that. But uh, the, as far as I know, the ecosystem around Fukushima in the ocean had, uh, suffered no damage from it. There's certainly no lasting damage. It's not like. Uh, um, entire species uh, got exterminated or something like that. So the the damage is quite limited. And right. Temporary. All right. Then I think on behalf of everyone that's still here and that had to leave for lectures and on behalf of the Energy Club, I would uh, really like to thank you for your time and for this lecture and your, yeah, for this okay. really nice q a session from everyone as well and um for everyone who signed up we will send the slides that are not made and this presentation has also been recorded so if you're interested you can look it up on our website in a later moment so thank you again okay thank you too this was uh, my were... first uh, online lecture so it was a new experience for me <laughs> yeah maybe maybe you can do a real one in september yeah that would be nice or maybe some sort of a discussion forum uh, in real yeah. life yeah. in the meantime for the people that want to get in touch with each other some people got in touch through the chat but you can also use our facebook or our member platform to get in touch with each other if you have questions or want for a discussion and uh yeah to wrap things up thanks again and then we're going to close the meeting thanks everyone for your time and thank you okay. Anna. Bye. thanks a lot thank you bye bye